Hi my loves, welcome back to me and my ever-growing piles of books. Um, I'm going to have to start figuring out where to put proofs I'm not going to read um, and how best to distribute them. But that is beside the point because today I'm going to be doing my June, July and August books video. So I always forget to do this but here is the pile. It is relatively big and in terms of how these three months, how my summer of reading went. I didn't have as many like five star best of the best reads over the summer but I did have a lot of good solid books. The next book video I do will be my September and October books. So obviously I'm running my book club proper on Patreon these days um, where we get together to discuss the books and I do a little vote on there between three books for people to vote for the next book club pick. So the one we decided on for September is Vita Nostra by Marina and Sergei Djachenko. You may remember I have read this one before. It's a pretty good spooky season one but it definitely uses and then flips some of the tropes of fantasy writing. Basically a girl called Sasha ends up at this very mysterious school um, or kind of university slash school. Uh, I don't fully know the Ukrainian school system <laughs> and it's definitely a magic school but what is she learning? Yes it's very strange, very mysterious, um, very kind of odd uh, and yeah I thought I would include it in the vote that I did on Patreon um, because I found this book really intriguing. I listened to it and I'm excited to reread it and I think hopefully it'll make for some good discussion. As, as I said it's kind of good for spooky season. And the other book we've chosen, the one for October, is Stoner by John Williams. It's not about a stoner. <laughs> I don't actually have this one yet so I need to buy it so I get to buy it. Which I'm excited about. William Stoner is born at the end of the 19th century into a dirt poor Missouri farming family. Sent to the State University to study agronomy, he fall instead falls in love with English literature and embraces a scholar's life so different from the hard scrabble existence he has known. And yet, as the years pass, Stoner encounters a succession of disappointments. Marriage into a proper family estranges him from his parents, his career is stimmied, his wife and daughter turn coldly away from him, a transforming experience of new love ends under threat of scandal. Driven even deeper within, him, within himself, Stoner rediscovers the stoic silence of his forebears and confronts an essential solitude. John Williams's luminous and deeply moving novel is a work of quiet perfection. It was first published in 1965 and I've heard so many good things about it recently and we all got a bit excited about it on the Patreon so um, that is our book for October. So it's not exactly a spooky season book but I will be running, um, I think well together we will run some buddy reads um, through October as well for some like spooky, proper spooky season books. So if you do want to join us on there, come and join us. It is one of the best things I've ever done in my online time. Um, I'm loving it and it's just so rewarding and nice to chat books with people around the world and with other voracious readers. You get early access to videos so um, my patrons will have watched this. Actually I think probably like a week in advance because um, of scheduling things going on on the channel at the moment so anyway we picked Persuasion didn't we for last month's last book videos book club pick. <laughs> I need to figure out a more succinct way of saying all of that but Persuasion by Jane Austen that's what we read together had my first inaugural zoom meeting with my patrons as well about it and it was so enlightening actually and so nice to talk about a book I've read with other people I know it seems so silly but well it doesn't seem silly but it's a new feeling to me because I've never done a book club before I've obviously um done a lot of English lit tutorials which are almost the same but not everyone's very interested <laughs> when you go into an English lit tutorial but um, it was so nice to chat about the book. I learned some new things and it helped me figure out how, more how I felt about the book and really come to a good understanding of the book I think in the end so yes Persuasion by Jane Austen. My first Austen in many 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 years. I can't remember the last one I read. I want to say I think I did a little project on Emma 
in my final years of school. So I think it's like 10 years since I last read some Austen. And I forgot how wonderfully sharp she is. I mean, her writing is so good on people and her characters jump off the page. They feel so vital. Um, and you can really feel how attuned her pen is to her human foibles and the things that make us like funny little creatures, basically. You know, that sort of writing that she does about people and their contradictions and their, well, their internal contradictions and the way they sort of go about getting what they want. I think she does an amazing, amazing job of. And Persuasion is as good example of that as any over the course of her writing career. Now, of course, this book was her last book and um, I think we had some speculation on our Zoom. This therefore not being like the most polished or fully fledged or fully fleshed out book that it might have been. It was a little slow to read. At the same time, it's quite comforting and nice. If you haven't read this and you do want a nice cover autumnal read. Um, a big section of this is set over kind of autumn and winter um, in the countryside and it's very, it was kind of cosy to read but not a lot of propulsive action. Now I can't really remember from my experiences of Austin before but I think we all agreed that um, it was a little slow sometimes, even compared maybe to some of Austin's other books. But anyway, Persuasion follows Anne Elliot. Um, she's the kind of forgotten middle sister of the ailing aristocratic Elliots of Callinch Hall. Ailing in that their father is a bit of a spendthrift and they don't have any money, really. So they have to move out of Callinch Hall, uh, their ancestral home, and the family moves to Bath. And has a little bit of time with family members in other parts of the countryside. And they get in some people to rent Kellynch Hall, basically, to provide some income for them. Um, and Anne was forced to break off her engagement with a very young, handsome naval officer in her youth. Um, and now, at the grand old age of 27... Uh, her prospects are looking rather dismal. Um, so then cue the return of her former beau, who is related to the people that are now renting Kellynch Hall. And there's some heartache after a long separation. It's a classic will they, won't they? You all know I don't read a lot of romance. It's not really my favourite kind of storyline. I don't derive much satisfaction from romantic storylines. But if you're going to read some romance, I do think... There's worse people you could go to than Jane Austen. She does do it well. And also just the writing is great. As I said, all those kind of character studies are just so good that it really compelled me to keep reading, even though romance isn't usually my thing. I feel like the ending is a little rushed and that definitely could be part of the kind of slightly unfinished aspect of this book. Um, I don't think the re I also don't think the reader gets the chance to connect properly with Captain Wentworth. We kind of all agreed on that one as well. We don't really feel much. I think um, I can't remember who pointed this out, so I'm sorry I've forgotten. But um, someone pointed out that um, she doesn't like narratives like this kind of an old love or an old flame narrative where you don't see those early scenes of them together because you don't get that why is there that connection why is there that pull towards each other because we don't see that part now I don't know whether a novel like this would even do that whether that's kind of a modern thing to have like a flashback or start there and then flash forward I think we needed that background for us to really feel invested in the relationship between Anne and Captain Wentworth. So yeah, at the same time that I thought this novel could have been longer, I felt I felt it was slow, as I said, and the ending was a little rushed and slightly unsatisfying. However, it has prompted me to want to um, read more Austen again. I haven't ever read Sense and Sensibility. There's a few others I haven't read and I the last time I read Pride and Prejudice I was 10 years of age so I do feel like it's possibly time for a reread because that was 18 years ago. I feel old. Let's go back to sort of the thing, the books I love the most and we'll work our way through. They're not necessarily an exact order of how much I liked them but um, let's start with some good ones. So obviously in Over the Summer I wrote another of my Sunday Times roundups. Sorry I'm mentioning so much. It, I feel like it um, 
dictates a lot of my reading at the moment so uh, hence why I mention it so much and of course I was reading various proofs so a lot of this or even just books because I think by the time I read them they were no longer proofs they were just published books um, so there are a few of those in here there will be some for September and October as well because I'm writing another one kind of currently but I'm a little bit behind but anyway Venomous Lump Sucker was my pick of the article basically my favorite one that I read and it's, yes it's called Venomous Lump Sucker and it's by Ned Bowman um, and this novel really took me by surprise as I think some of the very best novels do you know there's novels that you go into with very few expectations and they really really sort of surprise you in how in how good they are so it's called a zoological thriller that's kind of how it was um, sort of marketed it says it on the back here I think zoological thriller I wouldn't say this was a thriller at all personally um, this book is really quite funny I mean it is it is a drama things happen the characters go on a dramatic journey I suppose but I definitely wouldn't say it's a thriller so don't know what that's about I don't know if it's was trying to sort of include itself in the eco thriller genre I feel like when you read books about eco issues they're often thrillers so perhaps they just didn't quite know where to fit this one in because it is um, definitely a book very much concerned with ecology it is about mass extin extinction that is its sort of main focus um, and yes, it's a funny book about mass extinction. I know it doesn't sound like a very funny topic, and it isn't, but um, Bowman definitely takes to task the whole world, basically, and our approach to climate change, to mass extinction, um, and it's a really kind of caustic, playful, incisive analysis of, of the inner workings of late capitalism and how it kind of destroying the earth. So um, one of the things he does for instance is kind of set in the not so distant future so a world a little bit more advanced than us. Um, so for instance he creates this extinction industry whereby big you know corporations can buy um, extinction credits when they're when they're about to destroy the habitat the last remaining habitat of some animal they can buy extinction credits um, they only have to buy one if it's just any old animal <laughs> but they have to buy 13 if the animal is de um, designated intelligent so of course then that creates a whole new industry and it creates a need for for biologists to go in and assess species intelligence. And this is so disgustingly plausible to me. Um, I was immediately impressed just by that, but I think Bowman does a really fantastic job of just covering all bases on this, really looking at the issue from all sides, really creating his world in a very realistic way and seeing what the fallout would be from each thing that he creates. I think he does a really, really good job of that. It is a very nerdy book. Um, it's stuffed full of really interesting facts and information. Um, and I love that in a book. I love learning stuff through fiction because I mean, what better way to learn stuff, basically? There is a storyline to this novel. So we follow two strangers. Mark Halyard, he works for a mining company in the extinction industry department. And then Karen Resaint, who is a biologist, also working. She's freelance, but she's also, for the time being, working for the same mining company, learning and researching venomous lump suckers. And she's about to mark them intelligent when something happens, something big happens that kind of throws the world for a loop regarding the extinction industry and they're thrown together unlikely journey to save the last venomous lump suckers basically um so i said in my written review if anything this is kind of a buddy comedy but a very nerdy one one with a kind of very serious um undertone i suppose and I, I really really enjoyed it personally i think it also has a really good ending like one that is it's a little bit rushed maybe but a really kind of uh ambitious ending and i feel like sometimes with a book like this where there's so much going on and you know P bowman's packing so much in sometimes they have really disappointing endings but i liked this ending it was it looked out it was ambitious I'm being called. Not only it does have that like nerdy factual side but also I feel like we begin to care about these characters they're not 
your most likeable, instantly likeable characters, but we begin to really care about them. I think he gets the relationship just about right. Um, and so overall, this novel really worked for me. It's not going to be for everyone because it is dry and caustic and it does feel British. I don't know whether the kind of British humour of it, I think it will translate, but I don't know. It depends on your kind of um, your own take overall really really enjoyed this one, thought it was imaginative, interesting, funny, laughed out loud at it and I would highly recommend. So next we have The Lathe of Heaven by Ursula Le Guin. Um, this is one of her standalone novels, it's kind of a classic work of science fiction, it must be, I think it must be from the 70s, it feels like it is. 1971 so even maybe kind of 60s into 70s. It's always a little bit nerve-wracking reading a novel, a classic novel from one of your own beloved authors and this book is definitely a strange little book. I read a lot of these whilst we were on the road in America moving from place to place all the time so I do feel like maybe my concentration wasn't always quite where it should be when you're reading a book, especially a short book like this, but it is packed with really interesting ideas, with gorgeous quotes. And so I would definitely recommend reading this one in one or two sittings, um, just kind of sitting down and immersing yourself in it because it's a strange dreamlike book. And the reason for that is it's kind of about dreams. Um, it follows George Orr. He is a man who discovers that his dreams can shape the world around him. So if he, not all of his dreams, but some of his dreams, I think the example he gives at the beginning is who was really annoying him? Someone was really annoying him. Um, his aunt or something had come to stay with him and his mum for a long period of time. She was really annoying him. He dreamt that she was dead or maybe even just gone and he woke up and she had been dead for two weeks, that kind of thing. So um, he tries, obviously feeling immensely guilty about his power, as I think most normal people would, um, he tries desperately to stave off dreaming using drugs and this lands him in trouble. It's a kind of, um, it's definitely a future world where climate change um, has really taken hold even more so and um, you know there's there's various different institutions and stuff that we don't have now but because he has to take various drugs so he has to take other people's drugs in order to stave off dreaming he ends up being found out for this and assigned to a psychiatrist called dr william haber who is an expert in dreaming apparently um and basically haber feels very differently about all's power and wants to use it for good but of course um dreaming is a very imprecise medium to enact anything upon the world because you don't quite know how your brain's going to figure out um, how to do something, if you know what I mean. And he's certainly not a man who is very specific with his words, so all sorts of crazy stuff happens. Uh, so yeah, Haber uses hypnotism and stuff to influence all dreams himself and becomes very powerful, basically. So the book reads like a strange dream. It's constantly shifting beneath your feet. I don't always love dreaming in books, but I do think it works here. It's quite precise. There's no like long nonsensical stream of consciousness moments or something, which you often get with dreaming sections, which I don't like. Um, it is a science fiction book and it feels like a science fiction book. And yes, but the world does change and so all sorts of things come about as a result of this relationship between these two men um, and increasingly it moves towards something very chaotic, very alien. So this short book covers so much ground, it covers climate change and race, um, psychiatry and the balance of power between the patient and the doctor, what the purpose of humanity is. I know that Le Guin was influenced by Buddhism, influenced by Taoism, so a lot of that comes through in this book, you know, what is our purpose as humans? Are we supposed to do things or are we just supposed to be? It does read like a kind of oversized short story, a kind of extended thought experiment. It's difficult I think for us to therefore find like an emotional foothold in this book to feel very connected to the characters. As I said, you've got that dreaming element, so that sort of sh is constantly shifting. Le Guin has very specific things that she wants to achieve and show through the book, so there's not much of like kind of emotional storyline with the characters, 
but um, it did move me at various moments, particularly towards the end, as Le Guin is wont to do. Um, her books always get there in the end, I think. And it achieves all it sets out to do, this book, and I would definitely recommend it. It's very interesting. So next, a book I don't have. This is Appliance by J.O. Morgan. Um, this book is made up of stories about what essentially amounts to a teleportation uh, machine. So you put something in and then through, like it's kind of like a, a light bulb mechanism somehow. So the whole thing is lined with light bulbs and it somehow analyzes the thing you've put inside the machine and it will, well, does it transport it or does it recreate it somewhere else? The full way the machine works is never really explained. So the stories follow one from one another sequentially so you see how the machine becomes to be uh, comes to be adopted into our daily lives, into our routines, um, kind of globally. So it starts off uh, I think one of the early stories it starts off like something to just simply help move objects so this woman has been forced to use it sort of against her will because there are no moving trucks anymore. So they have to haul all of her stuff out the house, put it into the machine down the street to a machine near her new house, and then it will be moved from there into her house. So the whole kind of point of that story is obviously looking at it's just replacing one industry with another and is one more efficient than the other. Like, isn't it just easier to put it all in a lorry? get it down the road and take it all out the lorry and put it in a house. So it kind of starts off there and then it gets more and more intense and eventually of course it starts transporting people. I thought this was a really accomplished work. It rigorously works through all the different angles, all the different ways that a machine like this might affect our world. I've always liked thinking about the teletransportation paradox which is um, if we took me apart atom by atom and then put me together again atom by atom somewhere else would I be the same? Would I have my memories? Stuff like that. I, I enjoy thinking about that and this book certainly touches on that amongst other things. Some stories were obviously more successful than others especially I think towards the beginning when it was more familiar, um, when the world was more familiar I think the stories definitely worked a little better and towards the end less so um, because they also have to function as interesting stories in and of themselves in a book like this I think and I think the ones later on maybe didn't quite they weren't interesting as a story but more kind of what they added to the whole book but they needed to be interesting as a story. Um, I really liked the way this book explores how humans interact with new technologies and whether they always improve our lives in a meaningful way um, and the way we always, almost always accept a lot of new technology, not all of it, but a lot of it as kind of a universal good where we must be making progress to have this new technology and it must be a good thing to use it um, without even knowing how something works. You know, the majority of us have no idea how most of the stuff we use every day works or thinking about like what it means for our humanity. So I liked that Morgan did this by looking at a technology that hasn't been invented or possibly will never be invented. I don't know, maybe it will. Um, rather than writing like a diatribe about um, how awful it is that we're addicted to our phones or something like that. As I said about Venomous Lump Sucker, I love an ambitious ending. I don't feel like this book had an ambitious ending. Um, it kind of petered out, as I said. In general, I think it was really interesting and really interesting concept and an enjoyable read. I read it very quickly. I was always interested where Morgan would take us next. Next up we have Mama Day by Gloria Naylor. This is obviously a proof hence why it kind of looks weird. Um, so this book was originally published in the 80s. I hadn't heard of Gloria Naylor I don't think and basically Virago Modern Classics was going to republish it this year. I think they pushed it back to next year. I think they're republishing all of some of her work or all of her work but um, so I was considering it for a review for my roundup, but turns out it's not being published until next year anyway. So that's how I came to read this book that I knew very little about. You can definitely still get old copies if you're interested. But yes, there's much to love about this book, um, but it didn't completely work for me. So it follows Coco. She's a woman from this mysterious island, which is somewhere between Georgia and South Carolina. It is not a proper part of the United States, um, although it's kind of just off the coast a bit, um, and it's not on any map. Uh, and the reason it isn't is because it was sort of 
persuaded out of a slave owner's hand, hands by one of his slaves, um, Sephira Day. She is rumoured to have been a witch um, and she basically creates this paradise essentially um, whereby they're not subject to the laws of the United States. The former enslaved people that live there can kind of live together happily but Coco goes out into the world. She moves to New York and there she meets her future husband George. So yes, Naila is such an evocative writer. I mean it's rare that you come across a writer who really will put the characters before your eyes. She's good on the characters, she's good on the landscapes, she creates the world so realistically and um, that is always lovely to read. It is a very very slow book. I almost think because we get so much of that minutiae from Naila on everything and that's part of the power of the book, it also is a little bit of its drawback because it is so slow. We spend a lot of time in the back and forth of Coco and George's relationship, which by modern standards, I think most people would say they shouldn't be together. <laughs> it's one of those kind of, you know, fraught relationships, which I'm sure would seem romantic to some people, but to me, I just thought, you guys need to find someone else. The best sections were set on the island with Mama Day. So basically, Coco's only family that she has left are her grandmother and her grandmother's sister, Mama Day, who um, is rumoured to have some of the powers that Sephira Day had, their ancestor. So, yes, and a whole host of things happen, but it took a long time to get there and some of the magic for me was lost there um, in the process. And like I said, I read this one on the road, so I was reading it kind of piecemeal, and I just didn't feel the urge always to pick it up, because I was like, we're gonna get a lot of pages of Coco and George, which I'm not so interested in. But her writing is really incredible, so if I come across another nailer, I'll definitely be interested to read it. But yes, somewhat up and down for me. So next up The Pharmacist by Rochelle Atala. I don't know if I'm saying that right or if I should be saying it more like Rachel. So this is a really accomplished debut novel um, that manages to avoid some of the pitfalls uh, and of dystopian literature, manages to avoid making it too um, surfacy and just kind of obvious and general. Um, and it does feel like a book which has some real substance to it. It's not a perfect book or one that I would rush to recommend, but Atala definitely has a lot of potential as a debut author. I think she creates her world really well. So what is it about? It is about a woman working as a pharmacist in a bunker with a lot of other people. They're living down there um, after some apocalyptic event, which is never revealed. That will be unsatisfying to Sam I know it's not I think the focus really is on the kind of what being in a bunker like that would do to people and relationships and the way people interact with each other I think she really nails that feeling of claustrophobia of living inside the bunker how tensions are managed how power plays kind of play out I think she does a wonderful job also of capturing the sheer boredom that some somewhere like that might engender um, and the crushing anxiety and heartache and I feel like the plot is just about propulsive enough to keep you moving um, I definitely kind of wanted to see what would happen next and yeah I think she creates a real really realistic world in this book. Next we have The Roundhouse by Louise Erdrich. Um, I have such mixed feelings about this one. Um, it's a family living on the Ojibwe reservation. Basically it is narrated by Joe, who is the son of a tribal judge and um, his mother is also kind of a pillar in the community. His mother is, and trigger warning for sexual assault here, his mother is violently assaulted, raped. This causes huge, huge cracks in the foundations of his life um, and in the community as well. Brings up a lot of issues from the past, also legal issues, his father being a tribal judge and issues of how to prosecute the case. Um, and Joe, who is a 13 year old boy, is spurred then to seek justice, seek revenge against the perpetrator of this crime. And so instantly, perhaps, alarm bells are dinging for you, they started dinging for me, um, because 
the rape of Joe's mother becomes a sort of catalyst for his uh, growing up, his coming of age. That's kind of over the course of the story. That's where we're headed. It's also very much about his revenge, his experience of it, and not as much about hers. So this isn't the most enlightened way of writing about sexual assault. It doesn't um, empower the woman in the situation. Nonetheless, I couldn't help but feel moved by this novel, um, by the community that Erdrich creates, by the relationships Joe has with his friends. She weaves a really well-layered nar narrative. This isn't a whodunit. Um, you do find out the perpetrator fairly early on, and um, it's more, so it's less a kind of mystery novel than it is just about the community and I think Adrich writes it really really well. Whilst the overall movement of the plot didn't really sit right with me, I couldn't help but be taken in by this book. Um, it is quite a long book, it is possibly a little slow for some readers. I didn't particularly mind, as I say I really enjoyed spending time with Jo. Um, you do root for his revenge, of course you do. Could have been handled differently, of course. I have, so I'll continue reading her work. I haven't found my perfect novel from her yet. I did have some pacing issues with The Night Watchman that I read at the end of last year, but she does always get me thinking and reflecting on her writing, and I'm excited to read more. I've got one more on my shelves, so I'll probably read that one in the not too distant future. Okay, next we've got Shriek and Afterward by Jeff Vandermeer, none other than Jeff Vandermeer. So this is these days classed as the second volume in the Ambergris trilogy, Ambergris being one of my favourite of Vandermeer's worlds, it's so wonderfully weird. It's just, um, yes, a very very interesting world, I would definitely recommend City of Saints and Mad Men if you haven't read it. This is not my favourite of Vandermeer's, he does have a few misses in his catalogue. Um, and this one's not my favourite. It's still a worthy novel with some interesting elements. As I said, anything about Ambergris uh, I'm going to be interested in. But the, the plot, the specific plot of this book I just could never really connect with. It follows a brother and sister duo, Janice and Duncan Shriek. Um, Duncan is obsessed uh, with the grey caps, so they're the creepy mushroom people, which they are one of the best parts of Ambergris, so creepy. Um, and he's an academic, so he does research into them, but everyone sort of discredits his work because he has some quite outlandish and probably true ideas about the grey caps. So he's sort of ostracised from his academic community and he has some ill-fated relationship with a student, which I was a bit like, eh is exploring his life and it's also exploring Janice's life. She was a big part of the art crowd of Ambergris. Um, she had her own art gallery for a bit but she goes through all sorts of jobs. She goes up and down, she goes through addiction. Um, all sorts of things go on for Janice as well. She's very, she's kind of a trouble. They're both quite troubled. Um, and it's about their relationship with each other and everything that happens to, men, to them in their lives. And it's got a funny structure so it's obviously kind of supposed to be an afterward, so Janice is supposed to be writing an afterward to one of Duncan's works. Uh, but she gets distracted and writes all this stuff about their lives. And then Duncan, who has supposedly disappeared by the time that Janice is writing the afterward, um, comes in afterwards, after she's disappeared, and adds little bits in. So in parentheses, so um, there's a lot of <laughs> parenthetical uh, inclusions, intrusions by Duncan saying, oh, this is right, or this isn't true, um, or, you know, speaking to Janice, basically. So, of course, it's weird as well, um, and Janice also really often introduces the environment around her as she's writing to the story itself. So Vandermeer is often playing with that, especially in these novels. Now, that kind of works for me. Sometimes it felt clunky, but I always find that thing interesting. But this novel is just so slow. I couldn't, I just found I couldn't connect with the shrieks. I didn't really care too much about them. Um, partly because they, I guess they are bickering throughout the text. I didn't really ever have the urge to pick it up and it's quite long, it's like uh, 450 pages in this, in this copy. So yeah, I enjoyed the experimentation, I enjoyed the glimpses, the further glimpses of Ambergris. I think it picked up slightly in the second part where we get a bit more Ambergris um, and a bit less just literally interpersonal relationships um, of the academic and art 
societies in ambergris so we get a little bit less of that and a little bit more <laughs> drama in the second part but yeah overall glad I read it for sure because I'm you know working my way through all of his work and um, particularly ambergris as I say I'm interested in but not particularly enamoured with that specific book. I am looking forward to Finch though which um, I think might be more of a, a success that's the considered the third volume in the ambergris trilogy now um, next another book I don't have this is Booth by Karen Joy Fowler and I read this obviously it was on the book along list. Now I am the target audience of a book like this. Fowler has written in lots of different genres including speculative fiction. As I've said a million times she has a story in my big weird anthology that I read earlier this year um, that I really enjoyed. Um, she also writes historical fiction this being historical but combining those two things I like it. This is not speculative historical fiction but there is the inklings of that in her writing, a kind of distancing method, like a, an eerie atmosphere certainly to the opening sections of the book, um, you know talk of ghosts, a little bit of willingness to dabble in that sort of thing which I really enjoy. Um, and it does suit this novel perfectly as well because this is a family steeped in Shakespeare. It is about John Wilkes Booth who uh, assassinated Abraham Lincoln. It's about his family. It's kind of not so much about him, especially the early sections um, and Booth has a little note that she writes, writes at the end about how she wanted to um, explore the family of someone who does something terrible, uh, how to love someone or come to terms with your love for someone who does something awful, who you don't agree with, and that she didn't want to send to John Wilkes Booth himself. And I think to a greater degree she does a good job of that. You know, we mostly focus, he had a lot of siblings, so we mostly focus on three of his siblings, I think it's three, so it's Edwin, Asia and um, Rosalie. Um, but yes, so if you didn't know, his father was a famous uh, well, British actor that spent a lot of time in the US, Shakespearean actor. He basically had a wife in the UK and then took their mother over to the US to have a second family basically in the US. One that he was more involved with, I think, than his British family, because he kind of tours the US and lives there. And she has a lot of children and John Wilkes Booth, Edwin, Asia and Rosalie are part of that family. A lot of the men in the family um, then ended up being actors themselves so um, yes as I say it's a novel steeped in Shakespeare and it's a family steeped in Shakespeare. Um, so I think the first section was the best covering the siblings childhood. Um, I think Fowler did a really really good job of exploring the subtle differences between experiences within the same family that might set siblings off on completely opposite paths in terms of the way they see the world, um, their politics, their morals. Um, I think she does a good job of seeing all the little things that really split people, if you know what I mean, from the very same family. The middle section was a little bit slower, it might not excite all readers, I personally was captivated throughout. I have a quite high boredom threshold particularly with historical fiction so I was really interested throughout. Like I said I like Fowler's style, um, it's kind of simple but with a little bit of edge to it. And there's also some quite beautiful moving moments too. So I don't know that it's an absolute standout novel this one. It's not a wolf hall which is inventive in so many ways but I really did enjoy it a lot so yes it makes me want to read more of her work for sure. All right we're into the not so great books now so let's run through them quickly. Um, sea of Tranquility by Emily St John Mandel. Um, I've been recommended her work a few times over the years because I'm a big speculative fiction fan obviously I talk about it a lot but every time I've gone to read reviews of her work, something has set those little alarm bells off and just said to me, you will not get on with these novels. And this novel mostly confirmed my fears. I do, I do know that some fans of hers don't also like this book, not all of them, but some fans of hers say this isn't her best book, but I'm certainly not rushing to go and read another one, I have to say. Um, in general, I thought this book was pretty 
lazily drawn together. So it's a time travel narrative. Um, it's set over four different timelines um, with a kind of quite a tenuous connection between them that might leave you at the end being like, oh, what's the point of that? Like, what are we saying? with this connection and somewhat pointless. I'm not opposed to this kind of narrative, but it is really difficult to do it right. So as I say, there needs to be like a real point to the time travel element. Um, each section must be differentiated in style, in feeling, because it's set across four centuries. <laughs> um, the time travel element, yes, like I say, it was half-hearted, full of plot holes. Uh, the best section was by far the first, um, it had nice prose, and it had like this eerie atmosphere, it's set in the wilderness of Canada. Um, but after that they got increasingly rushed, less interesting. It just felt like Mandel was obviously relying on her ability to write up a good sentence, but the storyline was lacking on many, many levels. So definitely not for me. Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Um, a lot of authors these days are writing speculative fiction, but a lot of them, it feels like they're writing from a place of not liking or reading a lot of speculative fiction themselves. Uh, and this is definitely an example of that. Like, I don't think you can read a lot of speculative fiction, come to a novel like that, and feel like uh, Mandel had done a good, has done a good job with the concept of a time travel narrative. Like a rigorous, thorough job and really thinking it through and really just doing something interesting and maybe new with it. That's just a rant from me. Next we have um, Swan Folk by Kristin Omarsdottir. She is an Icelandic author, so I've definitely butchered the pronunciation of that. To be honest, first of all, beautiful cover, gorgeous. I have no idea what to say about this book. Um, sometimes I really saw flashes of brilliance in it. It definitely has a lot of layers to it. Like this is one of those books you could easily write an essay on. Um, but in general, in terms of reading, experience I just didn't enjoy it I just didn't um it does read kind of like a fable um it does have that sort of element to it which as we know from my experiences over the past few years that kind of thing is not my not my bag either and I think I've said that before is that the reason for that is that a lot of it doesn't it doesn't have an internal logic or it's very surfacey like fables are not supposed to be in depth interesting novels you know they are storylines that might have a moral or they might have a this things are just a symbol for something else but it's kind of like 2d compared to the novel format so that's why i don't always love fables or fairy tales convert converted into novels unless you do something on fairy tale like with it um to push it into the complexity it needs However, that's not relevant to this because this is complex, I would say, and layered, but I just didn't like it. It's very literary, uh, but yeah, a little bit too impenetrable for me um, for an everyday read. It follows a woman working in a kind of meaningless government job in a sort of strange, nameless country. Um, she seems a little isolated and a little odd, and she goes, she goes on lots of walks and she discovers this race of swan folk. Um, who are like hu half human, half swan, and they're struggling to procreate, that's part of it, they can't get an egg, like a proper egg to hatch, um, she's like taken in by them and repulsed by them, and it's strange and dreamlike, and um, she mentions it at work, and strange things happen. It's got some interesting themes in there, like I said, from statehood and personhood to like mothering and feminist themes, and about procreation and stuff like that um, but I just wasn't particularly interested in deciphering them to be quite honest. Um, I do like challenging literary fiction a lot of the time but this one just I don't think I was the reader for it. We didn't connect. Finally I read Upgrade by Blake Crouch and I have a lot of regrets about finishing this book. I should have just popped this one down. Um, luckily for me though, through reading it, I could just cross him off my list forever. I just don't think me and Blake Crouch are going to get on. Um, the opening seemed promising and the premise was okay in a world where genomes can be hacked. Um, the protagonist Logan has been upgraded to a higher form of human against his will and over the course of the novel we look at how this might play out, why was this done to him, how it affects his relationships and there's like kind of a lot of, there's an action, there's a lot of action sequences. It's kind of like reading an action movie. Um, but the execution was definitely overly simplistic for me. 
wouldn't intelligence look different on everyone what does that even mean to upgrade a person i don't know um it relied too heavily on its action scenes and it had the occasional interesting idea um about how intelligence interacts with emotions but then there's such a thing as emotional intelligence but anyway um but ultimately just too too generic for my tastes i'm afraid that is everything my loves i hope that you enjoyed this video um hope you enjoy vita nostra and or stoner um and i will see you again probably at the beginning of november sometime to chat september and october books bye